we'll look into discovery tools, also getting to know open knowledge maps at this point, and we will learn how the whole um, open science discovery ecosystem works. And then we will use this information in order to ensure that your research is more visible online. All right, so let's start with the discovery practices. And one of the most basic discovery tasks that many of us have to do uh, many times throughout our career is that we need to get an overview of a new field, be it that you're starting out in your PhD or that you're venturing into a neighboring field, writing an interdisciplinary research proposal, for example. This is really a task that comes up quite often. And what many people do is that they turn to their favorite search engine, for example, Google Scholar, and then they type in the name of the field, in this example, educational technology, and then they get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of results. And since you cannot read 2.5 million research papers, you mostly turn to a highly cited overview work like this one, go through it, go through the references, maybe also look at the citing literature to get an idea of what the newest works are in this area. And with time and patience, you can then build a mental model of the field. That is, you know the most important topics, you know the most important authors, you know the most important journals. The downside, of course, is that this process takes very long weeks if not months and in most PhD studies the very first year is dedicated to this process. So I think we all feel a bit like these poor people here. We're just swamped with the literature. 2.5 million research articles are published each year and that makes it very hard to get an overview of a field and once you have it to then keep it. And this is difficult for people inside academia but it gets exponentially harder when you step outside of academia, because then you cannot ask your colleagues, for example, or experts, because uh, you simply don't know where they are and how to talk to them. And we also see this represented in the numbers. So in terms of unsightedness, we have an uh, unsightedness rate between 12 and 82%, depending on the field. This gets even worse when we're talking about the unsightedness of data. So this was a piece of research that I was involved in as well. And there we found that up to 85% of research articles are actually ne uh, of uh, data sets are never cited. And finally, where it gets really bleak is the transfer to practice, because even in an application-oriented discipline such as medicine, only a small amount of uh, research is ever transferred from basic research to clinical practice. And in this example, they found that it takes on overall, uh, on average, 17 years. So at the moment, the discovery process is really broken. And there are many tools and initiatives now coming up who are trying to um, provide solutions for this problem, that we simply cannot stay on top of the literature anymore. And one of these initiatives is Open Knowledge Maps. And we are a charitable nonprofit organization, and we're dedicated to dramatically improving the visibility of scientific knowledge. And we want to do that for science, but also for all the other stakeholders in society. And our proposal is now to use knowledge maps instead of lists for discovery. And in a knowledge map, you have many advantages over a list. For example, you get the main areas at a glance. So in this example, risk factors, types of diseases and prevention. And relevant articles are already attached to each of the areas. So you can get immediately started. And our mission is now to create a visual interface to the world's scientific knowledge that is based on these knowledge maps. And we really want to revolutionize discovery and not do this for a single domain or a single discipline, but all of, for all of science and research. And finally, we want to turn discovery into a collaborative process. Because let's face it, whenever you have a discovery task, someone else already had it before you and they already have that knowledge. For example, this overview of educational technology but it's mostly in your head um, and it's not really um, 
expressed in a way that others can use and reuse it. So this is the theory. Now I'd like to show you the practice. Uh, so if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, then you can create a knowledge map of your own. And you can choose between two different integrations. We have PubMed, the big database in the biomedical sciences and life sciences, and BASE, the Bielefeld Academic Search Engine, which is a meta-aggregator over almost 140 million scientific documents. So here you can search in our disciplines. And I'm going to use digital education here as an example. And when you click on Go, we then create the knowledge map for you. And it looks quite similar to the example that I showed you beforehand, in that the bubbles represent the sub areas. So, for example, here education systems, digital competence, digital literacy. And once you found a bubble that you're really interested in, like digital literacy, for example, you can then look at the articles that are attached to it, you can look at the metadata. And once you've found a paper that you're really interested in, you can then also look at the PDF. Of course, only if it's open access. And so you can uh, see the full paper here. And uh, I talked earlier about collaborative features. So the first collaborative feature that we have implemented is that we have an open uh, annotation system here that's collaborative so you can add your highlights and your comments and you can share it with yourself or with the world. So this is Open Knowledge Maps in a nutshell. The advantages that we see is that you can get this bird's eye view of a field that you can identify relevant concepts. So this is often one of the most difficult tasks in discovery is to understand which words you're actually going to use for your search. You can sort the relevant from the irrelevant. That means if you're only interested in digital literacy, then you can stay within that bubble and branch out only later. And finally, while well, Open Knowledge Maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, open and closed, we'll always make it very easy to get to the open content, and we will always add additional services like this open annotation service by Hypothesis. Yeah, we're open science all the way. So all of our source code is shared under an MIT license on GitHub. All of our maps are Creative Commons by. That means you can freely use and reuse them. You only have to give us attribution. And all of our data is CC zero. That means it's in the public domain. The moment it's really hard to get to it. So we're working with initiatives like Wikidata to improve that. And we're also working in the open. We have an open roadmap. We publish many of our proposals openly. And we're working towards participatory development. That means that we're integrating our users and stakeholders in the development process. When I say we, I mean a core team of dedicated volunteers. And we also have the No Center as an organizational member. And recently, we were very happy to welcome the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft as a supporting member, or a very first supporting member. We also found many advisors from the open science and open knowledge world. We're really happy to have them because they're guiding us in the development of the tool and the organization. And we also found many partners uh, in the open science and open knowledge world because we see ourselves as a building block of this open science eco ecosystem. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We really want to build on top of what others have already created and also provide our input and enrich other services. We're really happy to also have Wikimedia Austria and Wikimedia Germany on board. Yeah, and I talked about participatory development earlier. Our first step into that direction are the Open Knowledge Maps enthusiasts. And uh, these uh, are power users and ambassadors of Open Knowledge Maps who take 
um, part or who conduct workshops and trainings in their uh, communities and then report the feedback back to us. Yeah, with this uh, service, we have created quite a lot of enthusiasm in the first two and a half years. More than 500,000 visits uh, were recorded on our website. Um, more than 100,000 maps were created. And we had over 1,000 participants in workshops and sessions such as this one. A few words about how it works. So an open knowledge maps visualization presents you with a topical overview of your search term. And it's based on the 100 most relevant documents from the two data sources that I mentioned earlier. So that's either BASE or PubMed. So in order for you to appear in open knowledge maps or for your research outputs to appear in open knowledge maps, they have to be indexed by either BASE or PubMed. And later on, I will show you um, how this can be achieved. And when we have got the metadata on our servers, we then use the text similarity um, to create knowledge maps. Uh, and we, uh, our algorithm groups those papers together that have more words in common in the metadata. So I've highlighted uh, the word metadata here because uh, we will see that the data about your output is in many discovery tools, it's more important than the content itself. So we'll also talk a bit more about that later on. Okay, so that was Open Knowledge Maps, but now I would like to take a look at other discovery tools and search engines that are widely used. And one that we've already talked about is Google Scholar. So how does uh, paper, how do papers get into Google Scholar? Essentially, they index PDFs from whitelisted domains. So most, um, universities, most publishers are whitelisted by Google, and that means that they take all the content that is there and index it into Google Scholar. And for a paper to appear, either the full text or the abstract must be visible to the user. And Google also likes um, machine-readable metadata as many other services. And machine-readable in that sense means that you have uh, these meta tags in your HTML code that tell Google um, what is the title and who are the authors and so on. So if you have a website within your own institution that is whitelisted by Google and uh, you list your publications there and you also control the HTML, then you can add these meta, meta tags and improve your discoverability in Google Scholar. In terms of processing, Google Scholar is almost fully automated. There is some limited human correction via Google Scholar profiles. So if you have a profile there, you can edit the metadata of your own publications and that goes back into Google Scholar. The output is only via the user interface. So Google doesn't allow for any other uh, reuse of this data. And that's why also we cannot use Google Scholar as an input for open knowledge maps, for example, because this is simply forbidden. In terms of the ranking, Google Scholar does something that most search engines do, that look at the similarity between the query and the full text. But they also have some internal prestige ranking of publishers and authors, which in turn influences the search results. And another thing that they do is that papers that were recently very often cited, that they rise in the ranks. Another tool that's widely used is ResearchGate. It's actually a social network, but it is also used as a discovery tool since it has search and recommendation capabilities. So how do papers get into ResearchGate? Well, it's on the one hand, the metadata and the PDFs provided by the users. So if you sign up for Google uh, for ResearchGate, they ask you to upload your publications. But ResearchGate also crawls publicly available information and adds it to its index. In terms of processing, it's an automated process. Uh, with some human input and correction. So for example, ResearchGate asks you to upload images in your papers to the platform. 
Output is via the user interface, but they also expose this content to search engines. And the ranking is unknown. So there is no public record of how they do the ranking within the search and recommendation capabilities that they have. Then I'd like to move on to Scopus and Web of Science, two products that many universities license. And here we see a bit of a difference of how the metadata gets into the system. Um, the metadata in this case is directly provided by the publishers of the journals, conference proceedings, and books that they index. And they also have a bit of a different process. They have automated processing, but they also have human editors who enhance the metadata. Output is via the user interface, but both Scopus and Web of Science allow for exporting the data and exposing them via APIs, so programmatic interfaces that other systems and services can use them. The problem here, of course, is that these are all paid services and you're not allowed to republish that data. So again, we wouldn't be able to use it in open knowledge maps, even if we had the money to pay for it. And finally, in terms of ranking, they use simply the similarity between your query and the metadata. So first takeaways is that these large commercial offerings, they aggregate a lot of research information, but they also heavily restrict the automated use and generally the reuse of this information. So information gets stuck into these systems. If you uh, contribute to these systems, then they can, this information can only be reused within them. And there is an alternative model now um, that um, is developing and that is growing larger and larger, and that's the open discovery infrastructure. And here, many of the same techniques and methods are used. But the difference is that the content is openly shared and also the metadata. So again, we have uh, researchers and publishers. And researchers now contribute to large crowdsourced archives, like preprint archives, such as archive.org and the Indonesian preprint archive, but also the large repository by the European Union, Zenodo. And they also contribute to institutional repositories. So when you upload it in the repository of your research institution, then this usually also becomes part of the open infrastructure. And publishers, they also contribute to that by providing their content um, and metadata to aggregators like PubMed and Crossref. And this is uh, one of the answers uh, to the question earlier on, how do you get something into PubMed? Well, you need to publish with a journal that is, that is indexed in PubMed. So all of these archives, repositories, and aggregators, they now have open interfaces so that others can reuse this data. And that's something that meta aggregators now take advantage of. So we have here, for example, core base and open air, and they crawl all of this information and put it into huge indices. And these indices can then again be reused by value added services. So we've already heard about open knowledge maps, but there are also other services like refigure that allows you to take figures from different papers and put them into a new context. We have services like Unpaywall that provide large uh, large scale data on open access articles and open access copies of existing articles and uh, initiatives like content mine that take the content of the data and um, again structure it and try to find relevant entities that can then again be used for search and discovery and Earlier on, um, we also had BASE as an input to open knowledge maps. So if you want uh, to get your stuff into BASE, well, most of the time it will already be there because um, you have either contributed to a crowdsourced archive, an institutional repository, or published it with a publisher 
that contributes to these aggregators. If your um, resources are not part of BASE yet, there is a very simple sign-up process where you can add different repositories to BASE. All right, so now that we know how the tools and how the ecosystem works, um, we can take a look at how we can use this information to improve your own discoverability online. And there's basically three points that I would like to make. And the worst, first one is towards persistent identifiers. So persistent identifiers are unique IDs for your research output that never change. And so even if the URL of your paper changes, there will always be the persistent identifier that you can locate it. And also it works as a glue between the different systems to know which paper is actually which. And the most important identifier for outputs is the digital object identifier or DOI. So you should make sure that you have a DOI. If you publish a journal article, you will most likely get one. Also, most conference proceedings do this nowadays. But if you have, for example, a poster or a workshop paper that doesn't have a DOI, you can always upload it to Zenodo. And this will not only make this uh, available and part of the open digital infrastructure, but you will always also get a DOI. When you mention your output online, also use the DOI link. This is usually um, the best way uh, for services that measure the attention to your research to then aggregate this data and give you a report of who is interested in your research. And finally, there are also identifiers for researchers themselves. Most important one is org ID. And this makes it then easier for discovery systems to understand that, um, for example, if two authors have the same name, uh, who is who and who has published, published which outputs. And it also serves as a very nice profile of everything that you have published and this profile is open in comparison to ResearchGate or Academia, where it is simply closed off from the world. So I would highly suggest you get uh, an archive and link your uh, outputs to your profile. The second point that I'd look like to make is about metadata. We've heard that the data about your output is often more important than the content itself. So I would suggest providing as much metadata as possible. If you're asked to provide an abstract, provide an abstract. If they ask for keywords or classification, go through the trouble of spending a few minutes just adding these pieces of information because it will make it much easier for automated systems to process your, uh, your outputs and also to present them a lot better to the users. If there is the option to write the metadata in a structured format, then do that. So that means if you have, for example, two fields, one is where you can add the name as a single string and one where you can provide the last name and the first name, then choose the one with the two fields because then down the line, we can make sure that your last name is always your last name and not suddenly becomes your first name. And link to persistent identifiers if possible. Because even if then something goes wrong, down the line, we can still uh, recreate that information from the persistent identifier. And one example for that is the upload, um, uh, the upload form of Zenodo. And here you can see for the, if you, when you provide the authors, you can also optionally provide their org ID. And I think that um, really makes it uh, more uh, discoverable in the end. Yeah, and the last point that I want to make is the more open, the better. There's really good research that open access publications are more often read, they are more often cited, more often reused. And therefore, um, I would say that open access is good so that when people can read it. But if you want to also ensure the reuse, so for example, that an image from your article is reused in Wikipedia or that um, some uh, software that you created is reused as an open educational resource, then my suggestion would be to uh, license them under Creative Commons. 
actually, please don't use Creative Commons for software. That was a very bad example um, for software there are other licenses but if you have uh, any type of other content then creative commons applies and that means that you reserve only some of the rights uh, that you have as an author and for papers i really suggest using either cc by or cc by sa so cc by means that you um, give up all your rights but you still need to be attributed when uh, content from the paper is reused and CC by SA means that whenever someone reuses your work they have to give attribution and they also have to again choose CC by as the license. So this means that openness is carried on. And finally um, if you have data then please use CC0 because um, that means that it's in the public domain and we see with data that there are data sets that aggregate um, data points from millions of sources and you can easily see how attribution there can already be a big problem so for data i really suggest using cc0 and finally make sure to deposit your research at least once in a repository that is part of the open science infrastructure so if you have a journal article for example it will most likely be in crossref and then you're already good if you upload it to your institutional repository, there is a high likelihood it will end up in the open science infrastructure. But if you, for example, have a poster that you only presented at the conference, you can then upload it to Zenodo, and in Zenodo it will again become part of the open science infrastructure. Okay, so that's it for the tips for the current discovery system and now i would like to conclude with a vision that we have at open knowledge maps for discovery in the future and how we see overviews of uh, research areas progressing and also how it can become more discoverable more reusable so that we actually build on top of each other's knowledge for that we have prepared a short one minute video that i'm going to share with you now sarah is a first year phd student in biomedicine starting her thesis on the zika virus Open Knowledge Maps has automatically created a map on the Zika virus for her. Sarah identifies a number of articles that warrant their own area. So she goes into edit mode. She adds a new area and drags the papers she found into the newly created bubble. She adds a title and places the area on the map. Sarah is interrupted by a message from a supervisor Lauren. Lauren suggests a presentation related to the Zika virus that she's added to their joint Zotero group. Sarah connects OK Maps to her Zotero account and imports the presentation into her map. OK Maps automatically places the new content on the map. Sarah publishes and tweets the link of her map for other users to explore and modify on OK Maps. The next day, she fires up her email to see that fellow PhD student Amar has added several papers to her map. She also notices that Tom, who's working on a map on Aedis, has included her map as a submap of his. Yeah, so we're a small nonprofit, um, so your support really matters. If you like Open Knowledge Maps, please tell your friends and colleagues about us. If you have any feedback, uh, we're always open and we're very happy to receive it to know how we can improve the tool. And finally, if you want to become a ambassador for open knowledge maps consider becoming an enthusiast and join a community of really um, great people yeah at this point i would like to thank you for your attention um, here are some pointers as to where you can reach us going on and it's really great having you in the webinar and yeah have a great rest of the day <music>